every road, no matter how far you travel, has some potholes in it. Time makes things a little rougher than what you would like. So when the film was originally finished, uh, a friend of mine, who I'd met on Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Robert Redford, was starting a company called EYR Programs. Redford said he would distribute the film on college campuses. And as you know, every time a distributor distributes the film, he wants to have the original negative in his lab so that if he needs to make more prints, he can make it instantaneously. Run in the kitchen, what's all the bitchin'? And then a couple years later, when I was getting deeply into making films, and I had a film vault in L.A., I wanted to bring the negatives back into my vault because it was no longer being distributed. <laughs> so I called up, and they said, oh, you know, we had a fire a few years ago in, in part of a building, and your negative was totally lost, destroyed. Well, it came as a pretty big shock to me. I think I had three prints. There might have been some other prints out there that were at college campuses that hadn't been returned yet. I didn't ever know about the Walker Art Center. And one day, Kit Carson calls me up and says, Larry, you know, there's this wonderful place in Minneapolis that's starting to preserve films. And I, I kind of like listened to him and I enjoyed what he was saying. And he said, you know, maybe we should help their film archives and, and give them American Dreamer. You see, because I own American Dreamer. And I said, I think you're right. There's no question, no question, Kit, that the film now is taking on a different meaning than what we intended. So why don't we give it to them? The American Dreamer came uh, to be a part of the, the Walker's collection through a touring film program that curators Bruce Jenkins and Nancy Robinson had put together in late 1987. It was called From Method to Madness. The retrospective came at a point where uh, Dennis Hopper's career was uh, gaining much more recognition, primarily through his work with David Lynch's Blue Velvet. Here's the lucky well, the history of this collection is an exciting 40-year journey, really, from the start under John Handhart in 1973 until today. And during that time, the collection has, uh, you know, become a, a, a body of work, as you can see some of it here, uh, mostly in film, and both 16 and 35 millimeter film prints that were brought into the collection over these 40-year time period. So the support for this restoration came through the Benson Foundation, which has been this uh, ongoing support that the Walker has had since the 1940s. It was really uh, Edmund Rubin uh, and his family that started the collection, and then his daughter, Nancy, uh, and her husband, Larry Benson, who continued the support over the next generation, and the Benson Foundation is now supporting the ongoing work that we're doing, including the restoration of this film. Would you like to know a secret? I'm really very, very pleased at the Walker Art Center because, you know, they went out and got a small grant to have the film restored because, you know, these prints uh, started to fade. Unfortunately, the film was printed on a very unstable film stock, and so the color was it was continuing to fade from it. It was going closer to more sepia. It was OCN Digital Labs uh, that did a scan of all four prints of the American Dreamer, and they used the best sections of each one of them to create uh, this digital color restoration. <laughs> The other part of this that we're pleased about is that, as this will be on a DVD and a Blu-ray release, that the funds that come in from the purchase, some of that money will be coming back to the Walker in order to continue our work. That's all that I'm going to leave, man. I'm going to leave this in my movies and all this is bullshit. Because a man only leaves his work, it doesn't matter how much of this is done on him. You know? You know, Dennis, being a pure filmmaker in those days, really believed that uh, film is part of our history. He believed that this film had to be a mirror of that part of his life, and it is his story that we see. Uh, yeah. Well, you want to talk about 33 years, huh? 
I'm a big fan of Dennis Hopper. How can you not like the American Dreamer? It's just such a, it's such a way of looking at someone's creative energy as he presents it, but as he also sort of manipulates us as the yeah. viewer, as he's an actor, he's a not an actor. I mean, it was just an exciting moment in time uh, when it was made, and it captured something about that era that is priceless. Like, I, I started out taking photographs because I wasn't allowed to, uh, to make movies. You know, I didn't have, movies are very expensive. So uh, I don't crop my photographs, as you don't crop a movie. I mean, you can, but it's terribly expensive. Just like in the old days, people wrote books. They wrote on tablets. They originally wrote on parchment, then on paper. You know, without the library of books, we don't have a history. Without preservation of films, you don't have a big part of your history. And how we're going to preserve the images and the films from iPhones and iPads and all of that, I don't know. It's not going to be in my generation. They won't show you my photos. I don't. I just. I can't deal with this. Can you? <laughs>